Okay. I have papers for you. And you have summas for me. Let me hand these back first, and then I will come collect what you have for me because I will confuse the two piles. Um, I don't know if I have anything specific that everybody's doing. Here's what I really enjoyed. I had quite a few people argue for monarchy. And I was surprised. I don't. I did not keep a tally of how many people did one and how many did the other. But I really appreciated because I'm like you. I, we are naturally going to gravitate towards the idea that a republic is best. We live in one. There's a reason when the founding fathers formed one because they thought it was the safest, freest form of government to have. So we are naturally biased in that direction. And I, and I get that. It's fine. And it's very likely true. But I really appreciated those of you who made an effort. I'm not saying I don't like it if you argued for republic. But there were a fair number of people who just really thought about a monarchy. And some of you tried to support it. Or at the very least, in your refutation, you made some decent points that are pro-monarchy. So I will hand these back. I'll, as always, if I said something on your paper, or I corrected something, and you don't know why, please ask me here, Lauren. Um, Sophie. Oh, I'm going to have to throw you out, because I already said there were no beatings, so I have recourse to that. Jay. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, OK. Yes, I will, I will come around. Oh, this is your Monarchy and Republic paper. OK. I will come around and, yes, because it wasn't technically due, was it? No, it was last week. OK, OK. And then, so did, did, did I say ask me? Did I do an ask me on yours? Oh, no, you're giving me a paper. Sorry. I thought this was the paper I just gave. I didn't just give you back a paper. Sorry, Alice. I'm out of it. OK. OK. Oh, yes. So, Hannah had an issue that is an issue for many, many people. And um, <clears throat> it is the pronoun there versus he or she. Now, I'm not talking about it, and I'm sorry, I'm just going to say flat out in a weird way, like anybody can have that as their pronouns. Sorry. Uh, I live in the world where we speak English, and he, she, or it are are singular pronouns, and they or there is a plural. But there are certain words that are tricky. Everyone, someone. Now, when I say everyone, for example, it's the worst one, I think of a large group of people. Everyone in this class means all of you. But it doesn't. It means you, and you, and you, and you as individuals. Every one. And everyone is singular. Everyone is in this room. Not everyone are in this room. I doubt any of you would say everyone are in this room. You would probably naturally, you just naturally know that's, that's, what, that's what it's supposed to sound like. But when we say, Everyone in this room has their own book. Pronouns must always agree with their antecedents. Um, this is a favorite of the ACT SAT exam, just FYI. They like to, on those ones where is, you know, A, this is wrong with the sentence, B, this is wrong, you know, D, none of the above, as is. They like to throw these in, that you know that pronouns agree with their antecedents. So everyone, someone, no one, each, every, these are all singular, and they require a pressing opponent. Now, here's the, here's the extra problem on the other side. What if I don't know the gender of the everyone? Everyone in this room has, I have options, his or her own book. 
because you're mixed. There's no it's in here. His, her, or its own book. Unless you bring your dog and it has its own book. Um, but in general, people find it awkward to say his or her, he or she. And in that case, it has always been the default to do the, the he. If I say to you, everyone in this room has his own book, I am not slighting the ladies. I am following a grammatical format that says, if the genders are unknown, default to say his, because his or her is long and awkward. However, if you don't like that, his or her is perfectly acceptable, probably not its. But you can say everyone has his or her own book. It, it's longer. Sometimes people just don't use that construction because they don't want to deal with it. So they don't make that the subject uh, or the antecedent of their, of their pronoun. But I, when you do it, I'm going to mark it because I am just, I've had it beaten into my head for years that singular subject has to have a singular pronoun. Yes, sir. No. I'm, no, Ethan, it cannot. It can. Not changing. No, no, never. Never. I'm sorry. People do it, but that does not make it right. People speed, but that does not make it right. No, because there is plural. It always refers to a plural noun. Always. And it is an, ab I'm sorry, I'm going to get very heated. I'm going to start preaching. It is an abuse of language. No, I'm sorry. Um, it, it, it is it is standard English grammar that there always refers to a plural antecedent. And when it's used otherwise, it is used in a slang form. I'm sorry, I'm like, this is a hill I will die on. <laughs> I feel very strongly about it. Um, and it's partly because of the craziness, the gender craziness in our country. And it's like, no, you can't be, I will not call you a they, unless you are possessed and they are legion because they are many, unless, you, unless you're schizophrenic and you have multiple personalities, you can't be a they. You have to be a he or a she, or an it. I'll call you it. I would rather not, though. But but no, it's it's always okay. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, so you can avoid this by just not referring to everyone, someone. But Ethan does have a point in this. You are going to start reading this. You are going to see this in print because it is becoming it is becoming accepted. But I would be remiss if I didn't tell you it is not currently acceptable. However, I don't like it, but language changes over time. Language changes over time. And there may come a time when the new grammar Nazis of the world, you know, my, my next generation says there is perfectly acceptable. And I think we're going that direction. But for now, you know, you may take the SAT exam and see this, and if you think, oh, well, that's, that, that could be. No, it can't. There is always going to be plural. But 50 years from now, maybe not. Because as, oh, none of you have done my medieval class. That would be next year. Um, if you look at Anglo-Saxon or even Old English, like Middle English, like Chaucer, it's very different. English used to have endings, like Latin you know, for case endings for some of the words. And, it, you know, we ditched those because like, who wants to do that? So it might change, but, okay, yes, sir. Yes, because the, the, that's the whole the, you know, you and the issue. Yes, which I wish we had that. I wish we had a plural you still in play. That would help a lot, but we don't because language changes. So Ethan may be on the cusp He's the new and upcoming generation, you see, that's looking to the future. But I'm the old stodgy lady who says no. So Ethan and I can agree to have a personal uh, feud about this. Oh, you have an ask me too? OK, who's the her? I can't remember. Oh, Queen Elizabeth. OK, so Ethan, OK, I'll tell this really fast. Uh, Ethan said, was talking about monarchy, and he was talking about Elizabeth, what well, was about being a person like in touch with the people and funny. I read, I read, okay, we'll just do this and then we'll actually do what we're supposed to be here to do. Um, I read that Queen Elizabeth once was walking, this was maybe 15 years ago, walking around uh, the grounds of their castle in Scotland and she had a personal attendant bodyguard guy 
And she was just, you know, had the scarf and the coat and she was just walking around. And an American tourist couple came across the hill and say, hey, you know, do you, do you live? Do you, did you read the story? Do you live? Do you live here? It's like, well, she said, I don't live here all the time, but I have a home here. And I come, it's like, oh, you must be so lucky. How long have you been coming here? Well, you know, since I was a little girl, she told them. And they said, if you've been coming here for years, have you ever met the queen? And she said, well, I haven't, but he has. And you, you could ask him. And they said, right in front of her, said, well, is she, what's she like? They said, well, she can be kind of stubborn and cantankerous sometimes, but she's, she's pretty nice. And it's like, that's amazing. And like, like well, yeah, this has been fun to meet you. you had, can we take a selfie? Or would, would you take a picture? So she had the, the guy take a picture of them. They never told this couple that she was the queen. And, and, and she said later, I just couldn't wait to find out what happened when they got home and showed the picture to friends who figured out that they just had a picture made with the queen. Anyway, that was a charming story. Um, as we were kind of bashing kings and queens to some extent in our papers. Okay, I, um, you had a summa for me. Oh, yes, Lauren, do I hear? Oh, you have one too? No, I'll come and collect them in a minute. Okay. Uh, oh no, I was just I was just speculating, Lauren, um, that maybe I felt like you could have made your case stronger. That maybe you said something that I don't know if I believe that's true or not, but maybe it is. I don't know. Okay, I will take your summas now. On patricians versus plebeians. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Anybody else? Papers. Papers. There we go. All right. Any other papers? Okay. I ran out of time yesterday, so we're doing this first. Um, I had I was going to assign a summa to you, and I ran out of time yesterday, so you're welcome. Um, I decided to cancel that summa, but we are going to start a new a new essay. See, that's that's the right attitude. Um, this one's going to be a little different. It's only going to be five paragraphs because it is a look back at Livy and Romans in general. And also we're gonna keep reading a Roman historian, another one this next couple of weeks. And I write this down somewhere, blank space in your reading guide, piece of paper. What is the Roman worldview Concerning, okay, then I have a list, monarchy, which you just wrote about, but I threw it in anyway, suicide, treason, gods and omens, I feel like I am calling out the jeopardy categories, I'll take gods and omens for 400. And honor. I'm going to get out of the way. And no, you're not going to write about all of those. So just write them down, but take. Okay. Essay, or Essay, five paragraphs. I'm going to show you I'm not done writing here. So I'm going to move this out of the way again. I would like you to choose three. Now, we have seen episodes of all of these numerous times, all right, as we've been reading. Plus, like I said, you're going to keep reading another Roman historian. Um, I would like you to choose three, and you're not trying to persuade me of anything. I mean, maybe you're trying to persuade me that 
the Romans are serious about their gods and omens, you know. But you're not, so, so we don't need a refutation. This isn't a persuasive essay. This is what we'd call an expository essay. You're just, you're just kind of giving me information, okay? And it's going to look like this. You'll have an introduction. Then you'll have three paragraphs in which you discuss three of the topics that you've chosen. And then you'll have a conclusion. Conclusion. Okay? I am not asking you to write this paper this week. I am only asking you to choose three of those and jot down as many examples or, you know, uh, examples of the attitude towards these that you can think of. A lot of them are in your reading guide. You know, I asked you questions about them. A lot of them we've talked about. Um, and I would like you to have at least one concrete example from a book for each one to talk about it. And say, do they approve of this? Do they not approve? Do they take it seriously? Do they take it lightly? Yes. Oh, you can certainly write more. You know what? If you just have a lot to say about gods and omens, you know, you could turn that, you could spend a couple of paragraphs on that. But five would be the minimum. Thank you. You could do gods and then omens. Um, but I am advising you to just do the outline. Just think of concrete examples. Just spend a week thinking about it. Um, and then next week, we are going to write the paper. Don't write the paper because I'm going to give you something new to add into it. All right? Because if you do, I'm going to have to hand it back to you and say, nice, but take it home now and revise it, which I'd like to really get to the point where I do anyway, thinking about that next semester. All right? I just want you to think about the things we've talked about. What, do, they, do they approve? Do they disapprove? How do they feel about it when it happens? And give me an example. Okay? Is that clear? Okay. And that's why I was going to have you do a summa as well. Because, but I talked too much about Camillus yesterday and I ran out of time. Um, okay. We, oh, where is my, where is my picture? Hang on. My art of the week has escaped. What? Oh, here it is. Okay. Our art of the week is a chimera, the chimera of Arezzo. A chimera has a lion body, a snake tail, and on the other side, it's got a goat head coming out of the other side. <laughs> the other side. Bellera, hey guys, Bellerophon is the hero in the story that killed the chimera. Um, this is bronze. It's from about the time we're reading about in Livy, again. And um, apparently, it is inscribed with the Etruscan word that means gift. And so it was offered, it was an offering to a god in a temple. You know, we do that sort of thing. If the god does something good for us, we make a statue or a golden bowl or something and give it to them. So um, the chimera, I'm not going to, because of time constraints, I'm not going to pass it around. But it's really amazing. Cast in bronze, look at the ribs. Can you see the, the, the ribs? Like the, 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 you see how you can see, like it looks like the flesh stretched across the ribs. It looks not, it looks not metal. It's, it's really fabulous. And I think this is my favorite of the Etruscan things we've been looking at. You know, the weird, the weird, it is a goat head coming out the other side of his body for n no discernible reason, because he can. Because that's what he is. He's a chimera. He has many different animals in one. All right, let's dig into Livy, guys. You have climbed Livy Mountain and conquered. Good for you. Oh, um, I also want to say this while it's in my head. Uh, I will try to remember to reiterate it. It belongs at the end of our class, but 
sometimes if I wait till the end, you know. Uh, I, we are finishing our discussion of this, and the next book we're going to read, mine looks like this, yours may look like this. Um, it is a collection, it is several works. We're gonna read two of the works in here, but we're only reading one for next week. Um, uh, between Livy and what he's talking about, and Sallust, where he starts, there are about 300 missing years, all right? So like it's, it's around the year 400 when Livy stops telling us. And then we're gonna pick up around the year 100. And a lot of important stuff happens in that intervening time. Namely, three wars with Carthage, uh, the assassination of tribunes who try to get land reform passed um, famously, uh, and because of time constraints with our class, I made a video. I already, it's already on my YouTube, and I sat down in my library and I talked to you for 53 minutes about the Carthaginian, the Punic Wars, and the outlines to these talks are in the back of your book. They start on page 106. And so I would love for you to watch this video before you start reading the next book. It really puts the next book in context. The next book will not be unintelligible if you don't watch it. But there's so much fabulous stuff that happens in those 300 years I couldn't resist. So get yourself a snack, get a beverage, plop down in front of your computer, and journey to Carthage with me and, and watch Hannibal come over the Alps for 53 minutes. Yes. It's, I made it Monday. Yeah, I just sat down and made it Monday. <laughs> and sipped my tea. This movie was made Monday. Um, yeah, no, I, it was, it, so it's new. I understand what Ethan means. It's called, it's called Punic Wars and Agrarian Reform, or Agrarian Revolt. It's obvious, Punic Wars. And also, it's, it's on the top row of the videos because it's new. Um, anyway, I, I, I would love for you to watch that for me. I see because I'm the moderator of my channel, I can see how many views I have, but I can't see who viewed. So you see, you're, you're anonymous to me. Um, if you don't do it, I will not come hunt you down. But I had fun doing it because uh, I read some more Livy, you know, some of his other of the uh, 35 books that we have, uh, were, nine of them were about the, the Punic Wars. And, um, and if it gets you to watch it, there is a comment in there about a story. I read, it, I read a story where somebody used, there were so many dead bodies, they used bones to build fences. And the crops grew great the next year because of all the decaying bodies fertilizing the soil. Okay. Hey, if that grabs you, if you want to hear more stories like that, watch. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay, let's buckle down, guys. Um, I like that attitude to let's buckle down. That's good. Uh, we are going to breeze through book four because I really want to spend more time on book five, okay? I, we, we did talk about book four. Um, I'm just going to tell you that, remind you of the answers to the first two because we did talk about it at the, at the end of last week. Also, my other students, we didn't have, we didn't do that the week before. So the bill that was, was proposed by Canulius was that patricians and plebeians ought to be able to marry each other because that was one of the, the laws of the Twelve Tables. No intermarriage. And we talked a little bit last week about how that dooms the lower class to be perpetually the lower class. You will not be working your way up in this system. Um, we're going to follow that idea all the way through um, 
Livy, this idea of can there be a first person in a family to reach the heights of being quaestor or consul or senate? It's just like the first generation college student, you know, when your parents, nobody else in your family had been to college and you're the first person in your family. Can we ever get that in that system? Um, they also uh, were hoping that they could get a law passed that one of the two consuls would always be a plebeian. That seemed fair. As you, yes. The consuls have been back for a good long time now. They got rid of the decemvirs and yes, yes. And as soon as it was just that few years with the decemvirs and the consuls, the Republican system is back. Um, the patricians, as we read last week, had what we consider a very offensive argument against intermarriage. Was we will taint that good blood with the scum and riffraff of the world. And now, I, I got to throw something in here, though. When we say that, when we say that, it has a different ring to it than it did then because of Hitler. All right. It makes us immediately think of Nazis. And I don't think when they said it, that's what they meant. They really meant that, that society is orderly and that when we all do our own jobs and keep to our own stations, everything runs more smoothly. And I don't, I mean, they, it, Livy does use those words, you know, taint our blood, but I don't think it meant quite the nasty thing that we, it sounds like, yes, Ethan. They were. The fugitives and runaways and riffraff. You know, after 300 years, the riffraff cleans up real good and starts forgetting where they came from, right? They just start forgetting where they came from. Uh, so it's a good, a good point. Um, okay, so they wanted to elect... Uh, uh, plebeians to some of these uh, offices, consul, some of the other lower offices. But does anybody remember what happened when they opened up the vote and they let them elect whoever they wanted? Who did they elect? If you don't remember, that's okay. Maybe you can guess by where I'm leaning. They only elected patricians. They gave them the option, you can elect anyone you want, and they came back and they just elected patricians again. Livy says this, men fighting for their own liberty and prestige are very different creatures from men who are called upon to use their judgment, unclouded by passion when the fight is over. It's one thing to be in the thick of the battle and say, I want my rights. But after the battle's over, and you've gotten your rights, then you sit back and say, hmm, who I think is the best person for this job. It's a different matter. He says, the result of the election was a signal proof of this, for the three candidates returned by the people's votes were all patricians. This was Quaister, which is a, a finance officer. This went on and on and on. It took them many, many years of elections to finally get somebody in there who was um, not a patrician. I, just a second, I made a note to myself. Um, in fact, later, one of the tribunes was chewing the plebeians out for this very thing. It says, do not be surprised if nobody bothers to consult your interests. A man will work hard and face risks when he can hope for profit and place as a result, and he will shrink from nothing if only he knows that the reward is likely to be worth the attempt. But you can neither ask nor expect a tribune to shut his eyes and go charging with great peril and no profit into a struggle which will inevitably subject him to the remorseless persecution of the senatorial party. While you yourselves, for whom he risks all, do not lift a finger to add to his honors. No, no. Ambition cannot live upon air. Aspiration must have something to aspire to. It is, oh, no plebeian will despise himself. Once you as a class get proper recognition, it is high time we proved in a practical way 
whether some plebeian is fit for high office or whether we are to assume that vigor or ability in men of our class is a sort of monstrosity only fit to make people gasp with astonishment. Are worthy plebeians like a carnival sideshow? Or are there really worthy plebeians? Uh, vote for them. Show us they're not so rare. Why don't you cast your votes? Put your vote where your mouth is. Yes. Oh, that was at the bottom of page uh, 308 in, in my book. It was paragraph, it was 435, 436 maybe, if you can find your, your book and paragraph numbers at the top. Um, so they just continued to not elect uh, the very people that they had fought so hard to get elected. They did eventually. In the meantime, uh, what, uh, I, I feel like you could answer the next question without even reading this book. What do you think is Livy's perennial curse of nations? Take a wild guess. He's already complained about it before. Civil war, civil discord. He says, uh, civil war which arose out of political rivalry the perennial curse of nations and destroyer of more peoples than foreign wars, famine, pestilence, or any other scourge. Men fancy that the angry gods have sent to ruin them. I was really struck by that. Think of all the things that can bring a, bring a civilization down. Vesuvius erupts and Pompeii is in Herculaneum are gone. Um, an invader comes in and takes over your army. An earthquake. Earthquake doesn't really, you know, it's a bad enough earthquake, I guess. Wars, famine, pestilence, black death. And Livy's saying, I think civil war has brought down more countries than all those other things. I have not done an exhaustive survey of all civilizations of the world. But I'm curious, you know, especially since we live in a time, and so many people have, when just people have a hard time getting along in our country. We're not, we did have a civil war. We're not there yet, but it's something to guard against, isn't it? If it brings down more countries than anything else. Yes. Mm -hmm. Livy, also keep in mind, Livy is writing at the end of a horrible time of civil war which is what we're gonna kind of launch into in the next few weeks. We're gonna meet one general after another, Marius, Sulla, Pompey, Julius Caesar, who just go at it. Like, I've got an army, you've got an army, let's go fight it out. And you poor people that are in the way, sorry about that. A bunch of you are gonna die and we're gonna burn, your, burn all your houses. And, and you know what, I mean, this is, this is not a spoiler because you guys know enough history, I'm sure, to know this. It did bring down the country. It didn't stop existing, but it wasn't a republic anymore. They did not come through that time and have the same government anymore. They had an empire. They had an emperor who we could argue is even more than a king. Although they kept all the, we have consuls and we have, you know, we kept all these republican offices. But you're not going to have it unless the emperor says you can. So, so Livy is not only looking back at this time, but he's looking back over his own childhood and lifetime and thinking, it did. He doesn't say it. 
because I'm not sure it would have been safe to say it. Maybe the emperor wouldn't have liked it for someone to just say flat out, yeah, civil war ruined our country. Look what we are now, how we have a tyrant over us. Don't write that. You will get in trouble. But I think maybe he's hinting at it. I, yes, I think he might be hinting at it. And Augustus, this was under Augustus. Augustus wasn't a bad guy as far as emperors go. But it, it would be, yes, he's condemning the government. He's condemning the leader. Um, OK, so Cincinnatus, poor Cincinnatus. We talked a lot about him last week. The guy's like 80 now. <laughs> And he ended up being dictator again. And this was the, the next question I asked you. What happened in Rome that made them call this 80-year-old man in and say, yeah, do it again? What was going on? Did anybody write down an answer for that one? There, it, it, somebody was threatening Rome, but it wasn't from outside. There was a guy named Spurius Milius, and he's just, you know what, this is a good example, because um, one of my students, not one of you guys, but somebody else emailed me about the Summa and was trying to make sure what, what made you a plebeian, you know, and plebeians aren't necessarily poor. This guy is a corn merchant. He's wealthy, but he's not upper class, okay? He's just, he's a merchant. But he had tons of, Livy says corn, but they mean grain, because you know corn, they didn't have corn, corn. It wasn't, the corn was not corn. Um, I don't know, that's why they call it that in old books. Um, and he was just passing it out free. What happens when you give people things for free? Okay, A, they expect it. How do they feel about you? They like you. This is at all times and places, right? If someone important gives you free stuff, you like them and you support them. Calm down. And uh, they thought apparently he was going to try to make himself king. He, had, he was so popular because he gave out free stuff. And Livy does not tell us what concrete evidence they had. But apparently it was enough to, to make it a serious, um, a serious uh, charge, not just gossip. In fact, they sent one of the lictors to arrest him, and, uh, and he ran. You know, it always looks bad when you run from the police or the, like, the police ever stop you, don't run. Anyway, the guy didn't stop. Didn't put his hands in the air, whatever. And they killed him, which was a legit thing to do. It was a resisting arrest. And it was highly, I mean, we would, we, no, I'm not going to get into police shooting people who resist arrest. Not going to go there. But in Rome, it was, an, it was a legal act. And Cincinnati stood up, and I just have to read this because I find it so amusing. I feel like I would have liked Cincinnati. I would like to just have dinner with him. He would have been an interesting companion. He says this, um, Spurious Milius, a fellow who might have hoped and hoped in vain to be made a tribune, a rich corn dealer of humble birth. This was the man who thought he could buy our liberty with a bag of flour and that Rome, the mistress of Italy, <clears throat> could be lured into servitude by tossing her a biscuit? Really, you're going you're gonna to sell out for food? He thinks you would sell out for food. We're Romans. We don't do that. Unfortunately, maybe the, some of them would have. I don't know. So since I'm asking you to look at monarchy, or we could possibly choose that, even for, what year is this? 439 BC. So we're 300, over 300 years, 320 years into Roman history. And they still feel so strongly. If they just, if it just smells like somebody wants to be king. Take that man down. Get him. They, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have, ex they probably would have exiled him. But he resisted arrest. But still, it is important to them. We do not do kings, yes. Yes, the taller stocks. 
That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, finally, here, I have notes. I scribble more notes to myself than I can possibly talk about. Um, let's just do the last two questions and move on to book five. Uh, what event, this is top of page 22, what event finally happened for the first time in Roman history? Um, you can probably, if you didn't write it down, you can probably guess because I was talking about the fact that it hadn't happened yet. A plebeian got elected. Uh, Livy tells us um, <sighs> the popular party was angry at who got elected consul. They showed their anger at the subsequent election of Quaestors and also had their revenge for plebeian candidates were returned for the first time in history. There was only one patrician all plebeians. And here's, I was talking about this just a little bit ago, that we're watching this idea stream through, and it's going to stream into our next book. The important thing was that a beginning had been made. New men, new men, they called them that, novus homo, a new man. He has never had anyone in his family elected to office. He's first generation. New men could at last see their way to the clear to the highest office of state and the most splendid military honors. The patricians, on the other hand, were as angry as if they had lost their right to office altogether, instead of merely being forced to share it with their opponents. What they asked was the world coming to such a pass would be what use would be the rearing of children, only to have them robbed of their proper inheritance. They are going to hold on with a death grip. But another several hundred years is going to pass. And we've talked about, we talked about language changes, people's attitudes change. And by the time we get to the main, one of the main characters in the war with Jugurtha that you're going to read next time, he's a general named Marius. He's a new man. Nobody in his family had ever held office before. And that man got elected consul, and he got elected consul six times in a row every year, illegally. New man. These generals are going to spring up, and we're going to talk about the reasons for that. Anyway, so this is an important, like Livy's pointing out something to us that is lost on us a little bit if we don't know Roman history. Like in his world, new men spring up and grab power, and they may be in charge of the known world for a while. But back here, it's like, oh, it's so shocking. It's so shocking that these plebeians are in office. But things change over time. OK. Um, so <clears throat> they had fought and fought and fought. I'm sure they've been doing more fighting than you care to read about, possibly. Um, and. They were down to head to head with Vei, the town of Vei, V E I I, the place that has too many vowels, it seems like. It shows up in a lot because they are often um, uh, aiding and abetting other enemies of Rome, right? If they're not fighting them in their own right. And uh, Okay, so wait a minute, let me. Hang on, let me get my brain together. No, I don't want to read that. Okay, um, how did Rome react when the Senate decided to pay soldiers? And they're like, they weren't paying them before? No, they weren't. Um, we have an army. What? Um, oh, well, that's a good, that's a good di uh, distinction. Why don't you tell me how each of them reacted? The patricians were happy. Do you remember why? 
do, do you remember why the patricians were particularly happy? This is a very small, by the, why the patricians were happy to do this for the army. Yes. Yes. We like it when people give us stuff. And uh, we, we, we are favorably disposed to you now. You patricians aren't such bad sorts. It says the Senate, without any suggestion from the people or their tribunes. This wasn't one of the, the tribunes are pushing for a bill, right? The Senate issued a decree for the payment of soldiers on service out of public funds. Hitherto, every man had served at his own private expense. I got to get my own weapons. I got to get my own arbor, armor. If I've got, if I'm of a certain social class, the equites, the knights, that I can afford a horse, then I got to provide my own horse. Got to provide my own food. The joy at this innovation was unprecedented. Men mobbed the Senate House, wringing the hands of members as they came out, called them fathers indeed in every sense of the word, and declared that thenceforward not a man, while any strength remained, would spare his body or blood in defense of so munificent a country. I will do anything for you. You're so wonderful. Only one group of people didn't like it. Well, they're all Romans. <laughs> Do you remember? It says the only people, it's a shocker, the only people who did not share the general pleasure and mutual good feeling were the plebeian tribunes. I know. Okay, but wait, they make a good point. Admirable though it seemed at first sight, experience would soon reveal its deficiencies. Where, for instance, was the money to come from? When the government gives you money, the government got the money from somewhere. Where does the government get its money? Taxes. Whenever the government gives you something, it is really just money they have taken away from all of you. <laughs> all right. That we presumably give to them because we want to pay our rulers and we, you know, we want certain things but often they use it for things we don't really approve of. But whenever the government says, we're going to give you this boon, this financial incentive or whatever, yeah, that was my money. That was the money of everybody who paid taxes last year. We didn't really tell you you could do that with our money. So it's always a downside. The plebeians see this immediately. Um, in fact, a tax was imposed and the tribunes publicly announced that they would protect anybody who refused to pay it. But they got around this because the patricians, who, you know, were riding high because everybody thought they were great, said, okay, uh, I will be the first uh, here publicly. See me paying gold into the treasury. See me bringing gifts into the treasury. And everybody was like, yeah, they're awesome. I, I'll do it too. He's doing it. It's sort of the opposite of the two quoque. The, well, he does it too, but it's, a, it's used in a good way. Well, he did it. I guess I should do it too. If, if the patricians can pay even more than they have to, so publicly, then I guess I can, I can do it. What, what are you disgusted at? I'm, your face is making me curious. But it's their own bandwagon. It was my bandwagon because I'm a patrician and I wanted to pay the soldiers because I'm doing this great, generous act for them and I'm, I'm going to be high in their estimation. Well, also, there's, but there's more to the story in a minute. Yes. Well, we are summarizing a group of people. Yeah. But the key, the key though, uh, is they didn't ask for it. 
because you said they're asking for it, but they didn't ask for it. But exactly. So they go out and they fight. And, and when there's a war, your stuff gets ravaged. And then you're not home to earn money. Um, however, I mean, this sounds lovely, honestly, except for what happened the next, um, in the beginning of book five. Um, they were at Vei. At this point, I guess arch enemy, because there's not they're not spread over to Carthage yet. This is the the mover and the shaker of the Etruscans that keeps causing trouble, and they have spent the entire summer making siege works around the city, digging trenches. Bless you. <laughs> We're all going to recognize that Kyle sneezed. Oh, bless him. Um, siege works, camps, and then the announcement comes. No, no. The Roman commanders, in the belief that a siege offered better prospects of success than a direct assault, took the hitherto unprecedented step of beginning the construction of winter quarters, intending to continue hostilities throughout the year. They didn't fight in the winter time. Everybody went home. And they said, no, we're going to stay here all year. So the tribunes say, so that, they exclaimed, is why the soldiers have been granted pay, a gift indeed, but a poisoned one, just as we knew it would be. The liberty of the people has been sold. What's behind this new idea of winter campaigning? We'll tell you. It's just simply and solely to prevent the presence in Rome of large numbers of those active men who constitute the whole strength of the popular cause. If they are not here, then nothing will be done for you. That is twisted. Now, I don't... I This is my interpretation. Okay, now, I don't believe that they that these two things were, were bound. We let's pay them so that secretly down the line we can force them to work, you know, or a campaign through the winter. And, and this is because, uh, this is the argument uh, that the patricians give back to the, to the tribunes. So it's not necessarily the plebeians who are raising a fuss. It's the tribunes who are raising a fuss. And they, the more people cause trouble in the city, the more power the tribunes have. So the tribunes can be jerks too, to say it that way. It's like we like it when there's general unrest because then we can flex our muscles and use our power. And if they're all out on campaign all winter, we're just going to sit here like logs and we're not going to have anything to do. But the patricians said, look, you have a year's pay, so give a year's work. That's argument number one. We're paying you what you would earn for a year if you were home. Men of Rome... Either this war ought never to have been undertaken or it ought to be conducted worthily and ended as quickly as possible. And ended it will be if we press the siege and withdraw only when the capture of Vei shall have crowned our hopes. God help us, my friends. Shame itself, if nothing else, should keep us in the field. And this is the next question I asked you. Um, oh, did I? Where is that question? Oh, it was the first question. What comparison does he make with the Trojan War? I'm just gonna I'm gonna answer it for you because I'm gonna keep reading. God help us, my friends. Shame itself if nothing else should keep us in the field. There was a time when, for one woman's sake, a city was besieged for ten years by the United Armies of Greece, far from home, with many lands and sundering seas between. How? Remembering that, can we shrink from sticking it out for a single year, barely 20 miles away, nay, almost within sight of home? Is our quarrel with Vei such a slight one? Have we no grievance against them sufficient to keep us at our task? Can you really believe that now, when all this mass of work has been brought to a successful conclusion, it ought to be abandoned, only to be begun over again the next year? He said, look, if we pull out for the winter, what's the first thing Vei is going to do? Well, they're going to bring in supplies, food, drink for next year's siege, and they're going to go to all their neighbors and send messages and said, come help us. We got them surrounded. Let's just get her done. 
it's a pretty it's a pretty good military wise it's a it's a good argument um and i and like i said i personally don't believe it was a setup i believe it was just this is a good military procedure we've got them on the ropes don't let up and fyi we are paying you so it's you can't sit here and grumble all winter that you're losing money back home you're not you're getting paid um Possibly, depending on, farming is notoriously fickle. It's better now that we have more control, you know, with fertilizers and stuff, but once upon a time, it was uh, iffy. Um, they, they go on to say, the tribunes have poisoned your minds. You have grown accustomed to listen to whatever they say, no matter how treasonable or destructive of the common wheel. You will just listen to anything those tribunes say. This is back to Alex's comment. They're insinuating you aren't thinking this through for yourself. Not that I'm taking sides in the discussion. But in this case, they're accusing them. Think about it. You just set up all the siege works at Vei. You're going to have to do it again next year if you leave. You don't want to do that. So they do campaign through the winter. The next question I asked you was what was the primary cause of the defeat. One of their generals was soundly defeated out front of, in front of Vei, Sergius. This was the, at the bottom of page 32 or 22. What happened? What's the deal? They didn't want to work together. <sighs> that is embarrassing. Their only help, there's two camps, a larger camp and a smaller camp outside of Vei. One camp is fully engaged with the enemy and it's not going well. Their only hope was to get reinforcements from the larger camp, for it would then be possible to fight on both fronts simultaneously with some chance of success. It so happened, however, that the man in charge of the larger camp was Virginius. And between Sergius and Virginius, there was a private feud of some bitterness. Yeah, no, it's not even, they just don't like each other. No, it's not even military. Virginius, accordingly, on receiving a report that most of his colleagues' strong points had been stormed and his defenses scaled, took no action whatever. Yeah, that's a shame. If Sergius, he declared, wanted help, he would no doubt ask for it himself. But Sergius was as pig-headed as Virginius was arrogant. And rather than appear to have asked help from a man he hated, preferred defeat by an enemy to victory gained through the intervention of a compatriot. So they all, they died. I mean, not Sergius and Virginius, but a bunch of their soldiers, because these guys could not get along. Question. How is that little story similar to most of what we have read of Livy. When people in charge cannot get along, everybody suffers. And Sergius and Virginius could not get along. And their men die because of it. Okay, so turns out they have to do something to take Vei. What is this weird thing that they have to do in order to take Vei? Do you remember? It's a construction project. It be like built. No, it was not siege works. I even told. I no, I didn't tell you. It says the, an Etruscan soothsayer told them. Yes, they had to drain a lake, the Alban Lake. I know, it's very random. It's very random. If you want to take the city, you need to drain a lake. The Alban Lake apparently started flooding, but it, which is weird because it has no rivers running into it. 
it just started rising, which they found to be a omen, <laughs> right? And so, you know, they've been besieging, they, you know, this actually ended up, the whole situation went on for 10 years, it took them 10 years to take Vei. I don't know that they were being paid all that time or winter quartering all that time, but it took 10 years. So just like uh, stories in, in uh, I don't know, World War I, World War II, where you're, you're, the, the enemy lines are pretty close. You can hear each other. And you're just stuck there. And I don't know. Like, I don't have an argument with Ethan, and Ethan doesn't have an argument with me. We're just stuck on these opposite sides. I'm like, hey, hey, you know? What's your favorite kind of music? You got a cigarette? You know, I would not ask him for a cigarette, but they would have. But that was a common, like trading cigarettes back and forth. And you get to talking with the enemy. And they're doing this, and this Etruscan guy just breaks out into prophecy suddenly. And he says, it says, suddenly burst into prophecy and declared that Rome would never take Vei until the water in the Alban Lake was drained off. But they said, well, who, who is this guy? Like, here, cigarette. Who's this guy? Like, he's our soothsayer. He's our prophet. It's like, ooh, I'm going to listen to him. So, hey, hey, let's talk across the lines again. Hey, you know, let's, let's shoot the breeze. And now I grab you and just carry you off to my side. Now, tell my commanders what you told me. He's like, okay. I didn't want to let it go, but we've always known, we've known for years that someday if an enemy drained the Alban Lake, they would be able to take Vei. And then it just so happens that they've sent, sent messengers to Delphi at the Oracle, and the Oracle comes back and tells them the same thing, drain the lake. So they drain the lake. I don't know, I don't have any commentary on that. They drain the lake. Um, I'm not going to bother to read you the actual Oracle, although it is in Livy. Um, well, well, okay, maybe we have to find out. I don't know where it is, though. I think um, just r dig trenches. Do you know what I mean? And, um, and then it would run off through the fields. Oh, let's see what the oracle says. It just says, draw it out and water thy fields with it, just like Hannah said. Thou shalt disperse it into rivulets and put out its power. That sounds like they're digging trenches. They do it, at any rate, because they obey the gods and omens. Um, now, the general in charge of the operations is named Camillus. And Camillus, um, it says, the doom of Vei was at hand. Marcus Furious Camillus, the man destined to destroy that city and to save his country, was appointed dictator and named Publius Cornelius Scipio his master of horse. He sets up, it takes over control of the operations at Vei, and it says, listen to this, good generalship was followed, as it usually is, by good fortune. Good generalship was followed, as it usually is, by good fortune. In other words, what is the primary force that makes people lucky? Being skilled and good and practiced and hardworking at what they do. Most people aren't just lucky. It may look like they are. Oh, isn't it lucky that Edison invented the light bulb? No, it wasn't. How many, like 200 and some materials he tried for his filaments? Oh my gosh. He said, he said yes, he said genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. That was his line. Yeah, good, good, good generalship or good performance of one's duties is often followed by good luck. Camillus was not lucky. He was really good at what he did. And they were um, digging, digging under the walls of Vei. All right, slowly digging under the walls, tunneling in, 
Nobody knew. In the course of time, Camillus began to realize that victory was in his grasp and that a town of great wealth was about to fall into his hands. There's a lot of money and loot in the city, so Senate, what do you want me to do with it? I said, well, some said, you know what, I think we should just let everybody go to Vei from Rome and just take whatever they want. Everybody will make, be so happy. Just open the gate, just take it, take it. Because they're always complaining they don't get enough money, right? They're always complaining we work them too hard, just let them take it. Take it. Uh, another group said, nah, let's put it in the treasury. Let's put it in the treasury and save it, you know, for... It is a great idea, but they voted for the first one. They voted for the first one, I think, because they didn't want to tick people off. They're sick of their wine and, you know. But um, before, before Camillus sent his guys in through the tunnel and Vei fell, he prayed and he said this, Pythian Apollo, led by you, shh, okay guys, shh, led by you and inspired by your holy breath, I go forward to the destruction of Vei and I vow to you a tenth part of the spoils. Queen Juno, to you too I pray that you may leave this town where you now dwell and follow our victorious arms into our city of Rome, your future home which will receive you in a temple worthy of your greatness. From every direction and with overwhelming numbers, Roman troops move forward to the assault to distract attention from the more imminent danger from the tunnel. No one in the town was yet aware that foreign oracles, even their own soothsayers, had already foretold their doom. No one knew that the gods had been invited to share in their spoils and in answer to prayer were even then turning their divine eyes towards new homes and the temples of their enemies. Ignorant as yet that their last day had come without the least suspicion of the dreadful truth that their defenses were already undermined and that any moment enemy troops would be in the citadel, the doomed citizens seized their swords and ran to defend the walls puzzled at what might be the significance of this sudden, wild, and apparently reckless assault, when for weeks past, not a single Roman soldier had moved from his spot. This is the next uh, question I asked you, but I'm just going to read the story. There's an old story that while the king of Vei was offering sacrifice, a priest declared that he who carved up the victim's entrails would be victorious in the war. The priest's words were overheard by some of the soldiers in the tunnel, who thereupon opened it, snatched the entrails, and took them to Camillus. So whoever's going to do the entrails gets to be victorious. Livy says this, Personally, I am content as a historian, if in things which happened so many centuries ago, probabilities are accepted as truth. This tale, which is too like a romantic stage play to be taken seriously, I feel is hardly worth attention, either for affirmation or denial. There's our Livy. He's like, yeah, it's a cute story, isn't it? It's kind of too cute. Well, I think he just, I think he just thinks the story is too pat. And but you, you might have something too. Maybe Livy is living in a more enlightened age, you know, where we don't really take that sort of thing seriously anymore. Isn't that quaint that they take it so seriously? But it sounds like a made-up story to me, says Livy. I told you the story because that's my job, but take it or leave it. They broke into the city, and uh, Camillus, Camillus raised his hands and prayed that if any god or man thought his luck and the luck of Rome to be excessive, he might be allowed to appease the envy it aroused with the least possible inconvenience to himself or hurt to the general welfare. Oh, gods, if you're angry at Rome because we're so fortunate, let it fall on my head. May the blood be on us and our children, you know, may the, may the crime be on us. Tradition goes on to say that while he was uttering this prayer, he turned around and happened to trip, which was taken by those who were wise after the event as the omen of his subsequent condemnation and the capture of Rome, a disaster which occurred a few years later. People scooped up the loot. 
They went to Juno, the statue of Juno, and she's big and she's heavy. And also the only people allowed to touch it were certain Etruscan priests. Suddenly one of the Romans said, Juno, do you want to go to Rome? Whether this question was divinely inspired or merely a joke, who knows? But his companions all declared that the statue nodded its head in reply. <laughs> we all are told, too, that words were uttered signifying assent. In any case, fable apart, she was moved from her place with only the slightest application of mechanical power and was light and easy to transport, almost as if she came of her own free will. It's very creepy. Okay, yes, Alex, did you, did you want to say something? Oh, good. Don't trip while you're praying, apparently. Did you, do you have a comment? Did you have your hand up earlier? Okay, so here's the problem. What, one of several problems. I just let all of you go into VE and take whatever you wanted. But I also vowed a tenth part of the spoils to Apollo. Do you see the problem? I have to take some back. So Camilla says, you know, okay, so actually when we were going to do the last push and we took VE, I, I made this vow. And so I need everybody to just kind of sort through the stuff you took and just on our system, just pick out a tenth of what you got, roughly guesstimate it, a tenth. Okay, now I'm already kind of mad at Camillus. Because as we have learned, and those of you who have been with me multiple years, people are very fickle. The general who is your hero one moment is, is the jerk you're getting rid of the next moment. But then, so they bring it in and he says, you know, I've been thinking about it, guys. And technically, if you think about it, the land and buildings should be included in that amount. So can you bring back a little more to cover the cost of the land and the buildings? Because those are also spoils of battle. Now I'm really getting ticked off with Camillus. You see? All right. And, and a group of people says, you know, <clears throat> Love the fact that you're paying me for, for soldiering and all that, but we've hit on hard times. And, and there is just land at Vei for the taking. Those people have all been killed or enslaved, or deported, whatever. And why, why don't some of us just go live there? Why don't you just divide up the land? In fact, here's a thought. Maybe half of us should just go live in Vei. Camillus said, not okay. Camillus was uh, violently against it. It says, what? He, I don't think he was consul. He was just their general. I will have to look back. Marcus. Um, I'm skipping, I'm skipping ahead a little. Well, actually, let's hold on to that. I don't want to skip ahead because I asked you again later. Um, ooh, okay. So they send Camillus to the next town, Falerii. And he is camped outside. And tell me what... I'm giving this away. Tell me what Livy, or tell me what Camillus thinks of treason. Do you remember the story of the school teacher? at Falerii. It's, it's the next, it's the, it's the question in the middle of page 23. So there was a school teacher and his kids just, uh, you know, spent all day with him. They just wandered around. It was, he had his own little private school. And, uh, and they would wander around outside on nature walks or whatever, I don't know, even though they were being besieged because the, it's just a bunch of kids and some old teacher, we're not afraid of teachers, we're not afraid of kids, let them do their thing. They can write in their nature notebooks or whatever they're doing and we'll just leave them alone. So this teacher, he just goes out every day and he wanders and he keeps wandering closer and closer to the Romans every day before he turns around. 
So finally, one day he gets really close and he just marches the kids straight to Camillus. And he says, boom, I just brought you the children of the leading citizens of Falerii. They'll do anything to get their kids back. You can cut a deal. They're your bargaining chip. They're your ace. Uh, well, Camillus thought so, because this is what he said. Neither my people, Camillus replied, nor I, who command their army, happen to share your tastes. You are a scoundrel, and your offer is worthy of you. As political entities, there is no bond of union between Rome and Falerii, but we are bound together nonetheless, and always shall be by the common bounds of humanity. Uh, war has its laws, as peace has. And we have learned to wage war with decency, no less than with courage. We have not drawn the sword against children, who even in the sack of cities are spared, but against men armed like ourselves, who without injury or provocation attack us at Bae. Oh, yeah, when they killed the kids in the baggage? Right. Flew Ellen? Yeah. Yes, the rules of war, Flew Ellen. Camillus had the... I love this. Camillus had the traitor stripped and his hands tied behind his back. Then telling the boys to escort him home, gave each of them a stick with which to beat him back into town. Take your teacher back and whack him all along the way. A crowd gathered to see the sight. And later, when the magistrates had called a meeting of the council to discuss this odd turn of events, the feelings of the whole population were completely changed. Where once fierce hatred and savage rage had made even the destruction of Vei seem a better fate than the tame capitulation of Capena, there was now a unanimous demand for peace. Oh my gosh, that Camillus is really an upstanding guy. I don't think we want to fight with him anymore. They say, you preferred honor to an easy victory. We respond to that noble choice by an unforced submission. We surrender. You won us over with your honor. And you never would have won us over with force. You would have had to kill us before we gave up. So, I like that too. You know what it reminds me of? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, that was, oh. Um, boy, I can't keep my mind, anything in my mind for a minute. Okay, it's uh, 525 is the, is the page number and, and paragraph that I have in my book. Um, so in that, so vei, falerii, there's peace, but there is not going to be peace for very long because a man named Caduceus brought a message. What was the message? A plebeian named Caduceus told the tribunes that in the new road where the shrine now stands above the temple of Vesta, he had heard in the silence of the night a voice. The voice was something more than human. It said, tell the magistrates that the Gauls are coming. The Gauls. So, who are these Gauls? They live, they're Germanic tribes that live in what we call France today. They came apparently from farther east than that, and all these tribes, even through the Middle Ages, for a thousand years, they're just going to keep coming in waves. The Gauls were a front wave, and they were considered to be just barbarians. Just completely uncivilized. And you know what? Italy is a nice place. I hear, I've never been, but I hear Italy is a nice place. And the Gauls heard it too. In fact, they say that a guy from Italy, I don't know why he would do this, but he brought some wine to them up in Gaul and he just introduced them to wine. I'm like, you like wine? We're going to move to Italy where they have the wine. And they just started coming across the Alps and settling down in lovely places in Italy. They liked it. But then you know how it happens. You you write home to your friends, you know, wish you were here, and then they come because you say, it's lovely here in Italy. The winters are nice, it's pleasant, it's pretty. Move to Italy. And they did. And they started, well, not if they can beat Rome. 
And uh, I asked you, uh, the second half of this, where was Camillus? Here is where Camillus was. As if this were not enough, a further folly deprived Rome of Camillus, the one man who might have saved her. While still in mourning for the death of his young son, he had been indicted by the tribune Apuleius on a charge of mishandling the plunder in Veii. We don't like the way you dealt with that. We don't know. You kept telling us to bring stuff back. Did you pocket some of it? He accordingly went into exile with the prayer that if he were innocent and wrongfully accused, the gods might speedily cause his ungrateful country bitterly to regret that he had gone. Not quite the level of Achilles saying, I hope you all die so you will respect me. But it's, it's just a, a minor version of that. I hope... If I'm, if I'm innocent, I hope, I hope you learn it and you regret what you've done. And oh, they did. They did. So they sent envoys. The Romans sent envoys. Did anybody answer the last question on the page? Unless on page 23. What did the Romans do to anger the Gauls? Do you think you know? That is certainly true. They didn't take the Gauls seriously. What time we got? For one. And the other is that, I'm going to tell the story instead of reading it because I want to read some other stuff. Um, when messengers go to another country, usually there's an understanding that they're safe, right? Heralds and messengers, we don't kill them. We let them come and go in peace. And so Rome sent messengers and they said, hey, Gauls, what you doing? Which probably said, well, we like Italy, and we just want this town here. They got land. We just want some of their land. And the Romans said, well, what makes you think you can just run around taking people's land? It's already theirs. It's like, well, we got swords. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. We got swords. And they were very insolent, the Gauls. And it just pushed the Roman envoys over the edge and they just pulled out weapons and attacked them. Again, you don't send envoys to be an offensive force. You send them to have a chat. Yeah, yes, and, uh, and negotiations quickly broke down, shall we say, when they, it says they broke the law of nations and took up arms and Everybody ran. They sent, they, sent, they sent an army out to fight them. Livy says, not good fortune only, but good generalship was on the barbarian side. They don't have Camillus. Camillus is happily living in um, a nearby town, Ardia. It says, the Gauls could hardly believe their eyes. So easy, so miraculously swift their victory had been. Um, so the, the people back at Rome here, they're in danger, and they start packing up to leave. They pack up the gods. They pack up all their sacred um, I don't know, like temple furnishings and get the, bury them or take them out of the city. They've got a hill. They've got a Capitoline Hill. They've got a fortress up there. I said, okay, some, some of us will stay and hold the citadel, the fortress in the Capitoline. But we only have food for a few. And really no one who's not useful with a sword, we can't really keep you up there. And some of the old men, these old patricians that the plebeians hate on, said, you're right. We, we wouldn't go up there and eat your food. We can't, we can't really fight with you. So, and we're too old to run away. Rome is our home. We're staying. We're, we'll, we'll just, we lived well, we'll die well. Say it. So, when the Gauls reach the gates, the first thing that they see is a line of old men just sitting there looking. Just sitting there. 
Here, go ahead. Let him let him go. We only we only have like five or ten minutes, so let him go. And he was rude. Yeah, all the old men, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, should, should I talk about the um, the Jewish people who are in the Capitol? Not, not yet. Um, thank you for that. Yes. Um, let's stop there because I want to read. For the Romans beleaguered in the citadel. I'm up above and I can look down. The full horror was almost too great to realize. They could hardly believe their eyes or ears as they looked down on the barbaric foe roaming in hordes through the familiar streets. While every moment, everywhere and anywhere, some new terror was enacted. Fear gripped them in a thousand shapes. Now here, now there, the yells of triumph, women's screams or the crying of children, the roar of flames or the long rumbling crash of falling masonry forced them to turn unwilling eyes upon some fresh calamity as if fate had made them spectators of the nightmare stage scene of their country's ruin, helpless to save anything they possessed but their own useless bodies. Never before had beleaguered men been in a plight so pitiful, not shut within the city, but excluded from it. They saw all which they loved in the power of their enemies. The Gauls for several days directed their fury only against bricks and mortar, Rome was a heap of smoldering ruins, but something remained, the armed men in the citadel. Um, okay, so let's leave. Meanwhile, in other places, in other news, Camillus is in Ardia, and it just so happens that some Gauls, when they get tired of rampaging Rome, and get bored or whatever. They just go rampage around the countryside and burn things and steal stuff, you know. And <clears throat> they happen to do it close to Ardia. And Camillus sees it, and he goes into the Senate house at Ardia. And he says, look, I know I'm not one of you. And you know I have no great reason to be devoted to Rome. But Rome is my home. And not to mention the fact that if they take Rome, do you think you're going to survive? They're coming for you next. Give me some men, and I will go whoop up on the Gauls. I can take them. And they looked at each other like, well, we do probably have the greatest living general sitting here with us. Maybe we ought to let him do it. And they do. He fights his way out. He fights his way through. So they're fighting in the countryside. But meanwhile, back in the capital, um, uh, the, the Gauls are still uh, surrounding the, the Capitoline Hill, and the guys are holed up in there. And they start thinking, I wish somebody would come help us. I wish there was someone who could help us. And Camillus, while he's rampaging, he says, you know, I'm not really technically supposed to be doing this. I haven't been put in charge of an army by Rome. Somebody really ought to, to consult the Senate. The Senate's holed up in the capital. I guess I'll do it. I'll climb up there. I know I, I'm good. I picture him climbing. I don't know what the terrain in Rome is like, but I feel him climbing up a rock face, you know. He climbs up the rock face, pops over the side and says, hey, senators, will you make Camillus general? They're like, done. Tell him, done. Great. Climb back down. <laughs> and I run off to Camillus. Yes. Hmm. Possibly. Um, the next day, some, some Gallic soldiers are just milling around. I'm like, oh, there's some footprints. Yeah, it looks like rocks have fallen. What's the deal? I think somebody climbed up there. If somebody else did it, we could do it too. So don't clang your weapons. Don't shout to each other. <laughs> climb up. And they're all asleep, except for the guards who aren't supposed to be sleeping in the Citadel. What wakes them up? Sacred geese. Sacred geese. I love the sacred geese. It's also a random thing. The geese that they didn't eat. You see, aren't they glad they didn't eat the geese? Because they could have used, you know, a goose dinner. They didn't eat the geese. The geese were sacred to Juno. And the geese started honking and making a big hullabaloo. 
and they woke up and it saved their behinds. The fact that the geese were honking. Um, oh, we, I just have to zip through this. Oh, it breaks my heart. Okay. Um, So they do not know, they being the guys in the Capitol, do not know that Camillus is on the way. Well, they, did, they, they know that they've told him, get an army and come, but they don't know what the state, where his progress is, the, the state of this advance. And we're going we're gonna to die, we're starving to death. Peace. We'll come down, let's just make peace terms. They agreed upon a price. 1,000 pounds weight of gold the price of a nation soon to rule the world. Insult was added to what was already sufficiently disgraceful, for the weights which the Gauls brought for weighing the metal were heavier than standard. The weights were cheating them. And when the Roman commander objected, the insolent barbarian flung his sword into the scale, saying, woe to the vanquished. In Latin, they... Victis. Sometimes you might see this. Woe to the vanquished. T tough. Translation. Tough on you. We won. We can do whatever we want. Camillus shows up just in time and he says, um, we don't pay off enemies. We kill them. And Camillus saves Rome. The guy they got rid of because they didn't like his handling of the plunder, saved Rome. And then Livy ends, and he doesn't, remember he doesn't end. Do you know what I mean? This is the end of book five, but he wrote 142 books. This is the end of his book. It's the end of the section. They want to move to Veii. They say it again. We, we're, we're tired. The Gauls ruined our city. The Gauls burned everything down. He says, why did I save you? If you're just going to leave, we just brought Juno. She nodded her head, you know. We just brought her. We're going to make her leave again? This is the place where the gods have brought you. This is the home of Romulus. This is the home, of, well, not really, because it wasn't, it was not until, but, um, but yes, this is the bloodline of Aeneas lives here. Why would you leave? And Camillus convinces them to stay. And Rome is saved for another round. This happened, oh, I should have looked up the date. I'm pretty sure it's 386 BC that the Gauls took Rome. It will not be taken again until 410 AD. It will enter on 796 years when no one will take the city of Rome. You bet you can't guess who does it in 410. The Gauls. The Gauls. The Gauls. Do it again. And when it, we'll talk about this next spring. And when it happens, St. Jerome, living in Bethlehem, writing the, the Bible into Latin, translating it into Latin, said, I think the world is coming to an end. The city who rules the world has fallen, and I can't believe it. I, I, I'm putting words in his mouth, but the attitude was, I think Jesus must be coming back any moment, <laughs> because this must be the end of the world. All right, you are going to read for next week. In this book set by Sallust, I told you this is several books. All right, several histories. You're reading the one, it's either going to be called the Jugurthine War or the War with Jugurtha. Jugurtha is easy. It's kind of a tongue twister and it's easy to remember. Where is Jugurtha? Jugurtha is a guy. Oh. Jugurtha is in Africa, but he's not a place, he's a guy. And I am not going to ruin the war with Jugurtha by telling you the shenanigans that Jugurtha pulls to get the Romans angry with him. But this is the story of a Roman... Expedition to Africa under some, some of it under the leadership of Marius, a new man who's going to cause quite a stir. We will talk about him next week. 
I, I think you will find Salah's style to be a little different. It's another history book, but it's a, it's a refreshing because it's a different written in a different sort of style. Um, and I think it's a little more, this translation is a little more easygoing, um, easy to follow. I think it's about 80 pages long. So we're just reading the whole War with Jugurtha in one week. All right. Thank you. I went a little over. Go get your lunch. <laughs>